Hello, my Kim One Section students. Uh, so this video lecture is for 15 July, Wednesday. So this will probably be about one hour 35 to one hour 40 minutes long. So whatever time I end this video lecture, uh, so whatever I cover today during this video lecture, that those concepts will be only on for exam two that's it so monday to stay wednesday the three day three days video lecture will show up on your exam two all right without further ado let's get this started all right all right, okay, let me do it again because I don't want to share application screen. Let me share my audio. All right, great. All right, really quick review as to what we we're talking about in the last class. We started talking about HTML base, and we said there are three theories of HTML bases, right? Arnie's theory, Boxer Lowry, Lowry theory, and then Lewis theory of HTML bases. The one that we are going to use a lot whenever I, we talk about conjugate acid, conjugate base, would probably be your Bronsted Lowry theory of HTML bases, where we're defining acid as an S plus donor, whereas base as an S plus receptor, which we can see clearly in this conjugate acid base pair, right? So if you think about this, and this is a H plus donor that gave this H to this. That's why this is an acid. All right, so then this accepted the H plus, that's why this is a base, right? That's why after this acid H plus, it became H three plus, and this F remains alone, F minus. All right, and then we said we can even define this in terms of similar to equilibrium constant K, but then it has a special name. The special name is, it's called acid ionization constant. And we see the same, remember, this capital K is the same as the way you've been learning in the equilibrium constant capital K. Just the name is different, right? They just call it acid ionization constant, that's it. If it's a KB, it's a base ionization constant, all right? So I want you to be comfortable writing these two reactions because this is how uh, an acid and a base, they react with water to give either hydronium ion or hydroxyl ion and this on their species. And you can write down the K and KB, making sure that you do not include the water liquid, similar to how you've been writing the equilibrium constant expression. And make sure you learn how to write down the conjugate acid base pair. The way we talked about how to draw the conjugate acid or base is basically to go from acid to a conjugate base, CB stands for conjugate base, you just remove the H plus. All right, so we said if you have H2O, it's conjugate base would be I remove a H plus. If I remember H plus, I'm left with OH minus. Right? Want to make conjugate acid CA conjugate acid from a base, you add a H plus, just the opposite. All right, so this is something that I talked about yesterday, and then I asked you to look at these values of K, and I said the higher the value of K or the acid ionization constant, the stronger the acid. So I use this example, right? This has the highest K value, that's why this is the strongest acid. This has the lowest. A value that's why weakest acid and then we said that the conjugate base strength will just be opposite right if you look at water the conjugate base of water is OH minus since water was the weakest acid here that means OH minus is going to be the strongest base here and so on all right and then your knowledge six seven and eight I kind of went through this now the next thing we're going to talk about is something called instant of HTN basis. So again, that's a quick review for you all, right? So again, what we have said 
in terms of k was whenever the k value increases the strength of the acid increase that means if you go from the bottom to the top what you notice is the k values of this acid hydrogen phosphate ion bicarbonate ion and so on if you go up right towards this you see that sgpo4 has the highest k at 7.5 times to the power negative that's why this is the strongest acid compared to all the other acids that's on the screen compared to hcl maybe it's not but i'm talking about this particular screen all right and then now the new term that you're going to see is something called pk now if you look at this numbers what they did was what the chemistry was oh looking at this number k was kind of hard right kind of hard to see which one is smaller bigger so what they did decided to do was they decided to take the negative log of k all the k values so when they took the negative log of the ka or the acid ionization constant value they got this number and they defined that as pk that's the one first formula you got to no, that means how to convert the K, the, sorry, the K acid anison constant to PKA. All right. Now, whenever I do that, take the negative log of all these numbers. These are the number I get. PK is 2.12 for phosphoric acid and so on. All right. Now, something that you should have noticed here is now we said higher the K value stronger the acid right but look at the pk values since the issue of acid increases as you go from the bottom to the top it tells us gives us the reason that the lower the pk value the stronger the acid right because look at this this is 12.66 that's a high pk value but look at this 2.12 that's why lower the pk value the stronger the acid all right and then these two formula i want you to like Keep it by heart, make sure you know this, because you will be using this a lot. All right, so something that you should have noticed in this formula, and we're gonna talk about it right, is, and then it's listen to all the formula with P in front of it. So anytime you see P in front of me, of anything, it just means minus log of that particular thing. For example, this PKA, all right? That means the formula is gonna be minus log of KA. If it's PKB, guess what the formula is going to be? Not surprisingly, it's going to be minus log of capital KB. If I tell you PH, what is the formula going to be? Minus log of, sorry, minus here, concentration of H plus. That's it. So do you see the connection between PK and then the natural log of stuff? All right. Now, assume that if you were given the PKA now, here with this formula, you can calculate the pK if you're given the k, right? If you're given the k, you can just take the natural log of this number and you get this pK value, right? But what about if you're given the pKa? How can you convert that back to k? It's a simple math, right? Something that you should be comfortable. With. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say simple math. I would say be comfortable with it, right? That means all I have to do is since log has a base 10, right? To convert, to find the k value from pk, all I do is take 10 to the power negative pk. This negative comes from this negative, and this 10 base comes from the base of 10. Since log has a base of 10. So k is going to be 10 to the power negative pk. And we can check here, right? So let's say if you're given the pk value of 2.12, that means my k value must be. 10 to the power negative 2.12. So if I plug in that number in my calculator, which I'm going to do it right now, I get 10 to the power negative 2.2. Look at that. I get 7.5 times 10 to the power negative 3. 7.6 technically, but it's fine. Right? So I hope you to this concept all right make sure you're comfortable with all these formula right instead of this if i ask you what will be the formula of poh guess what same thing negative log of a concentration of oh minus that's it 
because I'll be using this formula a lot in the problems that we're going to work out soon now. All right, so now the next concept we're gonna learn. Again, there will be lots of concepts here. Make sure you take your time and then go through all of these. Make sure you're able to solve some of these mathematical problems and try to understand this conceptually, right? That means basically if I give you this table, oh, you have to think about, oh, Ka is the acid ionization constant or acid dissociation constant. That's why if K is larger, the acid is stronger. All right, those kind of concepts, and then how is pK related to the strength of acid? All right, the so next concept is something called autoionization of water, right? So back in this slide, right? We talked about how this was the acid. This was the conjugate base of that acid because you removed the H plus to get this OH minus, all right? Now, if you think about this, the way we defined this as acid and base was through Bronsted Lowry theory, right? Because Bronsted Lowry L O W R Y tells me that acid is S plus donor, base is S plus acceptor. All right, so make sure you remember that. Now, based on that, going back to this, right, let's look at water and how it reacts with another water. So when water reacts with another water molecule, what, what's happening here, right? Now this H is going to be protonated or will be transferred to this OH2. That means this OH2 is going to be H3O+. plus. So that means can I say that this was a H plus donor? Why not? Because because of that H, which is in brown, you got the H3O plus. That means this is acting as, as an acid based on Bronsted Lowry theory of acid. Since this H2O accepted the H plus, all right, and that's why we call this water the base. Right. That means in the other side, this is going to be my conjugate acid. This is going to be my conjugate base. All right. Now, what does this tell you? What does this tell you is that means some of the substances like water, they can act as either an acid or a base, right? Because here it's acting as an acid, but here it's acting as a base. And we give that term, or those kind of species, amphiprotic species. All right. All right. So, why do we care about this? Because because of this auto ionization of water, we have something called the water ionization constant as well. So similar to how we have been defining the Ka and Kb in the earlier slide, right? We have the Ka and kb in the earlier slide same thing we can even define that as for water and again the way we write this expression is the same way we've been writing our equilibrium constant expression right in this reaction we have these two which are aqueous species that do show up in our equilibrium constant expression but then liquid do not show up that's why the KW for water is going to be concentration of H3O plus time OH minus. All right. Now, that KW is called the ionic product of water, right, which is equal to the sum of H3O plus and concentration of H3O plus and OH minus right here. And that product at 20 degrees Celsius is always 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 14. All right. Now, based on that, the acid ionization constant from for water, and if you multiply that with base ionization constant Kb of water, what will you get is this value of water. 
the ionization constant for water. All right, and if you want, you can work it out, right? So basically, for Ka, all you have to do is uh, take the acid form and then product divided by reactant, but then reactant doesn't show up. Do the same thing for Kb. And then if you calculate the value, it will come to be Kw, which will be equals to 1.0 times to the minus 14. All right, for this slide purpose, just a couple of things that you have to understand from this slide. All right, is this is true. The ion product of water equals to always the product of hydronium ion and then hydroxide ion, and that value is always 1.0 times in the bar minus 14. All right, and then even Kw equals to acid ionization constant times base ionization constant. Those are the only two things that you do know from this slide, formula wise. So let's kind of use some of this formula we just learned and let's try to figure out this problem. The question tells me, right, the base ionization constant for NO2 minus is 2.17 times 10 to the power minus 11. Calculate the K for its conjugate acid. Now, again, I wanted to start getting comfortable with those terms. Whenever I say conjugate acid, what do I mean? Whatever, whenever I say conjugate base, what do I mean? All right, so I'm gonna, since I don't have space here, I'm gonna use my whiteboard. All right, so first thing that I'm gonna do here is basically they have given me NO2 minus, right? And they have asked me the capital K or the acid ionization constant for its conjugate acid, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make its conjugate acid. So anytime I write CA, it stands for conjugate acid. And anytime I write CB, it stands for conjugate base. All right. That means to make a conjugate acid, what I say is you add a H plus. When I add a H plus, the plus and minus, they cancel out, and I end up with HNO2. So that tells me this HNO2 is the conjugate acid of this base. So this is going to be my base. This is going to be my conjugate acid. All right. So the question is asking me for the Ka value of this. That's a question mark, by the way, in my screen. That's in place to then write. All right, but what I know based on the earlier slide formula is I know that the acidification constant of that acidic form and the base dissolution constant for the conjugate base will always equal to an and constant for water. So now, do I know my K? No, that is unknown. Do I know my KB? Yes, the KB has been given to me as 2.17 times 10 to the power minus 11. And again, remember, when you are working through this problem, right, think about what does that, all these terms mean as you are working through it. So what I mean by that is, as soon as I see my KB, I'm going to start thinking, oh, it just tells me how strong the base is, right? And then the way Dr. Roshan taught us in class is, the higher the KB number, the stronger the base. So these are the things I want you to kind of start internalizing as you're working through the problem. Otherwise, all this uh, K1 becomes is a series of mathematical problems where you're not trying to understand the concepts. You might end up with an A in the class, not a big deal. All right? But again, conceptually, you might be weak. So I suggest like as you're working through the problem, what it means. All right. And in my earlier slide, I had said that the acid the ionic product of water Kw or the water ionization constant at 25 degrees Celsius was 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 14. All right, so all I do is do my math to find the K, divide both sides by 2.17 times 10 to the power minus 11, and I should end up with, hopefully my math is correct here, 4.61 times 10 to the power minus 4. So that is the acid dissociation constant of this acid which is the nitrous acid
So I hope this is making sense. All right, so now, you might have heard about this word a lot, right? When you were in high school, you have, might have talked about this PhD skill that goes from zero to 14, and you might have said like, oh, anything above seven, we consider those basic, higher the number towards 14, going to act more like a base, and then from lower than seven, we consider that those acid. Right, so the number closer to zero, we say that's a strong acid, right? And then seven is where water lies. All right, now when someone says pH, what does it mean? Because remember, if you think about this, we had said that pKa equals to minus log of Ka, and we said that Ka measures the dissociation constant or how strong or weak the acid is. And we said that, sorry, I shouldn't have circled that K because I don't want you to get confused with this K and this K. All right, remember this K is more like a PK. This is one term, PK. I'm talking about this K. But we said that capital K A, higher the number, the stronger the acid. Whereas with the PK, we said lower the PK, the stronger the acid. All right, now what does this pH means? Is basically pH tells you, now we're gonna use the same formula, the way we've been writing that, right? Equals to minus log of. So instead of writing this H, we're gonna write it down in terms of hydronium ion. So keep that in mind. In the earlier slide, I wrote the H plus to, for you to see the connection, but again, it's the same thing, right? Because when H plus is in water, it becomes H3O plus, all right? So basically pH measures, because remember, the way we define acid is the more concentration of H3O plus in that solution, the stronger the acid. All right, so keep that in mind. The higher the concentration of H3O plus in that solution, let's just say we are looking at it in water, the stronger the acid, right? Or in other words, the lower the pH, the stronger the acid. All right now, how can we measure the pH of the solution? All right, because nowadays all you have to do is you have something called pH meter, something like this fancy tool. All you do is you stick that pH meter into the solution, and guess what? It just gives you automatically some reading that tells you the pH, whether that's acidic or basic. Right? Think about this scale. And there are other stuff as well. You have something called PS paper as well, and based on how they change color. So if you look at these, look at this, all you have to do is, so these PS papers are literally this in color, right? It's kind of like, I don't know, dark yellow. I don't know how to say that. But then if you stick in that solution, the color changes depending upon what is the pH value. Do you see how this says pH one is this color, pH two is this color, pH three is this color, and so on, all right? These are a little expensive one. This ones. So again, the idea is same. All you have to do is you stick it in the solution, and depending upon how they change color, if you have a pH of seven, it changes color this way. If you have a pH of fourteen, it color changes the color this way. All right. So these are all called pH papers, which change color by responding to whether the solution is acidic or basic. And the other one you might have learned about something called indicators, right? Something like Tunnel of talent. So whenever it is put in an acidic solution, it changes color to some color. When it's a basic solution, it changes color to a particular color. All right. So I hope just uh, this is just an example of what, what different instruments are out there. All right. So we talked about Kw, K, and Pk in this slide. Sorry, Kw, K, and Kb. Right. Now let's go one step further. Let's try to. These are all these indicators that are that you can use to test whether a solution is acidic or basic. Now let's try to relate these terms, pH, pOH, and pKW. And again, remember, pH is basically nothing but minus log of 
the concentration of hydronium ion. POH is nothing but minus log of concentration of OH minus ion. And PKW is nothing but minus log of acid anion constant or the ionic product, whatever you want to call it. All right? But again, at the time you see the KW, think about water. All right, and how it reacts with on the water to give the H2O plus and OH minus. All right, so what I said in the earlier slide is basically pH scale is nothing but tells you what is the concentration of H3O plus in that solution. The formula I told you in the earlier slide, and it's even here pH equals to minus log of H3O plus. Whereas POH equals to minus log of concentration of OH minus. Now, if I wanted to find the concentration of H3O plus, if I was given the pH, the formula would be 10 to the power minus pH. Same thing over here. The relation between OH minus and POH is OH minus, concentration of OH minus can be found out by taking 10 to the power minus POH. All right, so based on this formula, if I plug in this value, 10 to the power minus pH for H3O plus and 10 to the power minus POS for OH minus, and if I take the, find the PKW, my final formula for the relation between KW, pH, and OH is going to end up like this. All right, the pH, and then POH, they always add to give you this number, 14. All right, this is another formula that you should be comfortable with. And again, make sure you start creating a list of formulas. This is open book, open note. My explanation is you have a piece of paper for the exam where you have written all the formulas and write down explicitly, oh, this is the formula where if, I, if I'm doing the POH, I can find the pH and so on, all right? Now, this number that you're wondering, where did I come from? That's the same number that I got from this. You see how the acid, the water decision constant or the ionic problem of water it was 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 14. So think about this is since these two have to be equal, that's why you have both of these equals to 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 7. Then if you take the product of this 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 7 times 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 7, you get the 1.0 times 10 to the power minus 14 molar. All right. All right, so let's work through some problem. How to relate this pH, POH, and PKW. So for example, for question one, it says the KW for water at 100 degrees Celsius has been given to me. And then it's asking for the PKW, all right? So anytime you see PKW, the first thing that I'm gonna do is write on my formula, I'm gonna close my eyes and I'm gonna say, oh, PKW is the same as how I've been memorizing the formula of PKA, how I've been memorizing the formula of pH, right? It's nothing but minus log of KW value. Now, do I have the KW value? Why not? They gave me the KW value for water at 100 degrees Celsius. All I do is I plug in the value. 4.99 times 10 to the power minus 13. And then your answer should be around 12.30. Now, the question number two going to be important from exam two point of view. So I'll be comfortable with this, all right? So this question, what is it asking you is basically how can we, and you can write it down, right, beside the problem. So this question is asking us how to find the pH and pOH of a strong acid. If I know the concentration, of a strong acid, which is in this case is 0.15 molar. How can I find the P 
PH and POH. This is what question number two is asking you to do. All right, so my whiteboard. All right, so, so this is what my reaction looks like. So anytime you are asked about strong acid, weak acid, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write down my reaction, right? How it dissolves in water. I have SBR, aqueous, dissolves in water. So that's H2O. This is a strong acid. Right, that means I do not have an equilibrium error, meaning that all this SBR will be converted to the hydronium ion. Keep this in mind, this is a liquid water, not aqueous water, plus the conjugate base. And this is where, as you're working through this problem, you start looking at acid, base, conjugate acid, conjugate base, right? So for in this example, this is my acid, not surprisingly. That means the other species has to be my base. Here, this Br minus is my ba conjugate base. S2 plus is my conjugate acid. So that means H2O and this is base and the conjugate acid. And then this acid conjugate base is this. All right, so now what they have told me is the concentration of SBR solution, right? So easy way to think about if you have a strong acid, if its concentration is given to me, we can assume that since this is all, first thing you experience is one is to one molar ratio, right? And all of this SBR is going to get converted into H3O plus, we can assume that the concentration of H3O plus is that as well. All right, so now I already had the concentration of H3O plus. The question asked me, what is the pH? And what is the pOH, right? Now for pH, I know my formula. pH equals to minus log of H3O plus. I know my value for H3O plus. What I do is I plug in that value. That is my pH is going to be about 0 0.82 right and then again this is where you have to think about whether the answer that you got makes sense or not because we define that sbr as a strong acid and on our in my ph scale it goes from 0 to 14 right and we have said that okay anything less than 7 is considered acidic right that means if it's a strong acid it has to be around this area isn't it 0 to 2 3 and look at that that tells you oh that means the answer that i got is correct all right, so I found my pH, done. How do I find my pOH? Now, the formula that we had come up with is pH plus pOH equals to 14. Now, if you're wondering where did I get this from, right here, pKW equals to pH plus pOH equals to 14. That's where I got the formula from. Right, so now I know my pH value, 0 0.82. That means I can easily find my pOH value by subtracting the 0 0.82 from 14. That means my final pOH value equals to 13.18. All right, I hope this is making sense. Again, what I want you to be start be doing is like, so I have written the topic as pHOH and pKW, right? Relationship between this, but then look at this problem and then try to write a topic out of this, right? So basically what he did was, what we did in this problem is, we calculate the pH and pOH if a strong acidic solution 
is given to us with a known concentration and that's what he did in this question well, that makes sense all right so for knowledge set nine what i'm asking you to do is you have an aqueous solution which has a pH of 6.67 so i'm asking you to calculate the ph as soon as you see this you're like oh it shouldn't be that bad right because he just solved the problem where he related the ph and pOH, there's some to be 14, right? So that means just based on that, you can easily find the pH of that solution. So I hope this isn't that bad. All right, so now in my earlier problem, I found the pH and pOH of a strong acidic solution. All right, now the question is, how can you find the pH of a a strong basic solution let's say if i gave you a basic solution for example sodium hydroxide right and in k115 you've learned that the hydroxide of the metal in group one and two they are strong bases and that's why if you throw that naos sodium na is in group one if you throw it in water it will make a create a strong basic solution this i took from alex a little bit twist all right so now I'm gonna give you kind of a what do you call that roadmap if you want to call it to kind of start thinking about it all right so i've been given the mass of that naos but again remember ph pos and everything we are talking about the concentration right that means your end goal is to figure out the concentration of either oh minus or h3o plus because once you do that you can find the ph right because my ph from lies minus log of H3O plus, or I can even use this. Instead of doing that, instead of finding the H3O plus, I can use this formula, right? pH plus pOH equals to 14. Either of these formula works, depending on which route you wanna take. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna kind of give you a roadmap. So if you want, want to take a stab at it before you look at my work, this is the roadmap. First, calculate the mole of basis, the base. N is the number of mole of the base. We just write on any of any of it rather than writing all the of any of it. Calculate N for any of it. All right. Then what you can do is you can calculate the calculate based on how many moles of any do you have you can calculate the constant sorry number of moles of oh minus uh, n for hydroxide and i and not just surprisingly right because if you think about this if you have any of it dissolving in water it is going to dissociate into na plus and oh minus and they are going to be in one is to one ratio right if you balance the reaction Number three is if I calculate the number of moles of OH minus, and if I'm given the volume, I can calculate the molarity of OH minus. Where did I calculate the concentration of OH minus? Because I know the formula that POH equals to minus log of OH minus. That means from three, I can calculate the POH value. Now, once I find the POH value, guess what? My pH plus POH must always equals to 14. Then I can find the pH value. So let's follow up. So I'm going to write it down. Number one tells me calculate the number of moles of any OH. All right, so I have to, so this 185 milligram, I'm going to change that value to gram. That's why it was 0 0.185 gram of any OH. It's molar mass is 39.99 grams in one mole equals to 0 0.00463 moles of NaOH. Done with number one. Check. Let's go to number two. Number two tells me calculate the moles of NaOH. Sorry, OH minus. And what I said earlier is one mole of NaOH 
gives me one mole of OH minus. That means not surprisingly for number two, I'm going to have 0 0.00463 moles of hydroxide anion as well. Let's go to number three. My number three tells me that I'm going to suppose to have, find the molarity of OH minus. My molarity formula tells me molarity equals to number of moles of OH minus divided by a volume in liters. But this volume of the solution that has been given to me is in milliliters. So I'm going to change that to liters. So this is going to be 0 0.140 liters. Right? So this is my number of moles per liter will give me molarity. But my math, I'm going to end up with 0 0.033 molar solution of OH minus. Done with number three. Let's go to number four now. Number four tells me that I can use this formula to find the pOH based on the concentration of OH minus. Right? Number four, I can find the pOH by using minus log of concentration of OH minus, which is 0 0.033. But my math, my pOH value is going to be 1.48. Now, the last one tells me I know that the sum of pH and pOH has to be 14. That means pH plus pOH has a value of 1.48. That should be 14 that means my ph is going to be 12.52 now again this is where you can check your answer right okay they were talking about the NaOH. that's a strong base and if you think about my ph scale what did we say we have 0 7 and 14 and we said anything around 7 through 14 right that those are bases the ph remember this is my ph scale that i'm talking about I look at my number 12.52 that tells me oh it looks like i have done something right because if you calculate the ph value for a strong basic solution and you get something like let's say i don't know three then that's somewhere that's the point where you question yourself right but shouldn't that be greater than seven and you might have done something wrong all right so this is your knowledge check 10. so what i'm asking here you and i'm going to give you a hint for this knowledge check 10 right in the LX, LX problem I solved in the earlier slide, which is this slide, what I'm asking you is to find the concentration of hydronium ion solution. Look at that. I've even given you the formula for this. pH equals to minus log of H3O plus. Do you know your pH? Yes, you do know your pH here because we calculate the pH to be 12.52. That means you know your pH. All you have to do is calculate the concentration of H3O plus, which is hydronium ion. And remember, what did we say about the formula for hydronium ion and how it relates to pH? I'm just going to leave it blank because you better know that. In the couple of slides earlier, I told you how can you relate the pH to the concentration of hydronium ion H3O plus. And this is just plug in the numbers and you get the answer. All right. So again, I am throwing a bunch of stuff at you. Take some time. Do not try to. I, I cannot emphasize this point too much. Do not try to cram in everything at once. It is going to frustrate you, frustrate the heck out of you. Trust me. Take your time, like five, six topics a day, right? Or like five, six topics in like one or two hours. Take a break, do something else, and then come back and then another two, three topics. If you try to, Digest all the information at once, it will probably frustrate you a lot. So I want you, it, this to be a learning experience, not a frustrating experience for you. And I do understand some of you are working and studying at the same time. Again, try to spread them out as much as you possibly can. All right, next concept now. So we've been talking about a strong exit, a strong basic, a strong base solution, right? A strong basic solution a strong acidic and a strong basic solution now let's kind of start thinking about but what about weak acids and bases all right so something to keep in mind so whenever you have a strong a strong 
acid, right? So if you have strong acid, like HCl, when it dissolves in water, what happens is this goes completely to completion, where you get the H3O plus and Cl minus. And that's why I use this arrow, one-headed arrow, right? But if you have a weak base, so let me just call that weak base, let's say something like HNO2, right? That is in your list of weak base. What happens is, okay, it does react with water liquid, right? And you get the hydronium ion. And then the conjugate base, which is going to be my NO2 minus. But the arrow that I use is something like this, right? Or it's the same as something like this. What is this telling me is these reactants are in equilibrium with these products. Meaning that, let's see if I have about five molecules of HNO2, probably one or two formed all of this the other three or four still stayed as HNO2 in that solution. All right, so this is called the equilibrium error. So the way to define weak acid and bases, they do not ionize completely in aqueous solution. That means you have a lot of this HNO2 left in the water solution because they do not ionize into this form. All right, so there is on the example of a weak acid, the acetic acid, there's the CO2H, or this H that I'm pointing at, that is going to be the H plus donor. All right, so anytime you see a reaction, you start doing the acid base, conjugate, acid conjugate base, right? So that's my acid. Water is my base. H3O plus is going to be my conjugate acid. CH3CO2 minus is going to be my conjugate base. And like I said, since this is a weak acid, it is just going to ionize to a small extent in water. Meaning that, let's say, if there were five molecules of acetic acid, probably only one molecule will form this hydronium and then the conjugate base. Remaining four of them will stay in its original form in water without getting dissociated. All right. All right. So now, for this reaction, I can write my acid ionization constant, right? Or the equilibrium constant expression for acid as product concentration divided by the concentration of reactant, right? So this is my product, product. And remember, the aqueous does get included in that equilibrium constant expression for acid, but not the liquid water. That's why I do not have the concentration of liquid water. No need for that. All right. Now, based on how much this gets ionized, chemists use the term percent ionization. So basically, the higher the percent ionization, the stronger the acid. That means stronger. Higher percent person ion equals to stronger the acid. Meaning that let's say if you have HBr, which is considered a strong acid, its person ion might be let's say 99.9%. .9%. Whereas if you have weak acid like CSCS2OS, it might be let's say 5%. All right, now the formula for person ionization is the concentration of H3O plus, like this H3O plus, in this reaction, this H3O plus, divided by the starting concentration of your weak acid. And then do not forget the time standard because you're doing the person ionization. All right, so let's figure out the person ionization. Again, important from exam two point of view, make sure you know understand conceptually what percentage ionization means. All right, and then how can you calculate that? And this is where I'm going to go next to calculate the percent ionization of a weak acid.
All right, so here's the person anison of nitrous acid, which is considered kind of like weak acid, which has a pH of 2.09. Right? I should be able to solve this in this case. I don't think I'll have to go use my whiteboard. I'm going to erase all my inks. All right, so let me write down. So I've been given the pH of that acid, right? From that pH, and the format that I know, I can calculate the concentration of H3O plus, right? Because my percent ionization for HNO2 is gonna look like this. So I'm just gonna write in percent ionization. It's gonna look like the concentration of H3O plus based on the pH value given to me, divided by the concentration of nitrous acid. Nitrous acid has a formula of HNO2. Times 100%. And guess what? I do know the concentration of HNO2 because they have given me this value. But I do not know this concentration of H3O plus, but not to worry because I've been given the pH. Right? The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write down my formula. pH equals to minus log of H3O plus or the other form that you learned is H3O plus concentration equals to 10 to the power minus pH. Then all I do is I plug in that value of pH minus 2.09 and I get my number as 0.00813. And I'm going to get that in this formula that I wrote. Now I have everything. Don't I? I just calculated the concentration of H2O plus, the concentration of nitrogen. Trust acid has been given to me at 0 0.125, and that means my personal ionization is going to be equals to 0 0.00813 divided by the concentration of HNO2, which is equals to 0 0.125 times 100%. And if I do my math, it is going to be 6.5%. And if you think about this again, now look at a number, right? Does it make sense or not? We just define this nitrous acid as a weak acid. If it's a weak acid, look at that, that number is pretty low, which is good because the way we had defined it earlier is strong acids have a person ionization close to 100%, right? Like SBR, HCl, pretty close to 100%. But weak acids, they usually linger around 1% to 10% percent ionization. And this makes sense given the fact that nitrous acid has been defined as a weak acid. All right, so basically this slide talks about person ionization, really important from exam two point of view. Make sure you take your time, internalize this concept. All right, so now next. So we talked about acid, weak acid. Now the question is, can we determine the Ka or PKB? Sorry, Ka or KB. So this is a constant of the acid or the base from the pH of a weak acid so question along the line of this so you have been given the pH of a weak acid and then it's asking for the Ka the acidation constant for this and that even given this formula now this is the sorry equation I want you to start getting comfortable and making sure you know how to write it yourself. I made your life easy and wrote it down for you, but make sure for your exam, you know how to write down the equation as to how does a, an acid or a base react with water. And so for this, first I'm gonna write down my expression for This is an acid constant based on this formula, right? It reaction. So I know this is the concentration of the product of the concentration of the product, or the multiplication of the concentration of the product divided by the reactant as to it doesn't get included. Now, what I know, what do what I do not know, is basically it has given the concentration of the solution of nitrous acid. That means I know this value. All right. 
do I know the concentration of H3O plus? No, but then they have given me the pH value, sorry, pH value here. Right, that means based on my formula for H3O plus, it puts it in the bar minus pH, I can figure out this H3O plus concentration as well. Now, the other thing that you should have noticed is basically this H3O plus and this, they are equimolar. The coefficient between both of those are the same. That means whatever the number of moles, the concentration of H3O plus you're going to get, NO2 minus is going to have the same concentration. Right? Look at that. I can figure out the concentration of NO2 minus if I know my concentration of H3O plus. So I'm going to find my concentration of H3O plus by taking to the power minus pH has been given to me as 2.34. Do my math, I'm going to end up with 0 0.00457. That means the concentration of NO2 minus is going to be the same as well. 0 0.00457. Means now I know everything. Now let's plug in this value. S2 plus is 0 0.00457 times 0 0.00457 divided by consists of H and O2 has been given to me as so 0 0.0516 molar solution. At my math, my Ka value is going to be 4.00 times 10 to the power minus 4. Right, so this should be 4.00, not 4.50. Right here. All right. I hope this makes sense. I do think about why do you think the NO2 minus concentration is the same as H3O plus, right? But remember, you can think that in terms of the ice table we've done so far, right? Whenever we work through the equivalent constant problem, the other way to think about this is one mole of H2O2 gives me one mole of H3O plus and one mole of NO2 minus, right? Let me erase all link on the slides. Right, so one mole of this, one and one, the equimolar. And then the volume of the solution doesn't change, right? It's the reaction flask, which has the same volume, the volume of the solution doesn't change. My concentration equals to number of moles per unit volume. Since volume is constant, number of moles, one is to one, that's why. I could say that the concentration of NO2 minus is the same as concentration of H2O plus. All right, so uh, I'm going to ask you to try to take a stab at this problem. All right, the answer key has been given to you as this. So you are given the, you are asked the concentration of hydronium ion H3O plus of this weak acid. And the pH, if you are given the molar solution of a formic acid. Oh no, I think I might have to uh, do this for you because this is a weak acid. And then I'll have to find the key. Okay. Right, because I'm going to think if, yeah, I might, because I don't think I've shown you how to use the, I stable for finding the concentration. Okay, you're doing this. So if I can figure out the, three figure out this three of plus. All right. All right. So for this problem, um, all right. So let me see and use the whiteboard for this problem because I don't have the work done here. So bear with me. <laughs> 
don't know why didn't I do the work for this one. That's weird. All right. So the question is asking me weak acid, formic acid, and they have given me the pH, not the pH. So what I have to figure out is pH equals to what? The concentration of H2O plus equals to what? All right. And so if I know my H2O plus, I can easily find my pH, right? Because I know that pH equals to minus log of H3O plus. So that means if I find my concentration of H3O plus, I'll be able to figure this out. So my focus should be to figure out the concentration of H2O plus. That will give me the concentration of formic acid. Formula is HCO2H and concentration has been given to me as 0 0.534. All right. Yeah, I think I'm going to work this out for you because I think I'm going to use ice table and then explain to you a couple of terms here. And this might be really important whenever we talk about the solubility constant for that. All right. So basically, when you're asked to find the pH from the Ka of weak acid, now on the information that had that you have been given as the acid dissociation constant or the ionization constant for that acid, right? The Ka value for this acid has been given as 1.8 times 10 to the power minus 4. All right, so now I'm going to write on my equation here and then create something called ice table. Ice, ice, baby. Ding, 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 ding. Ice, ice, baby. I hope you're singing this song along with me and having fun as you're learning chemistry. And as you work, are working through the reaction, I wanted to start thinking about what is my acid, what is my conjugate acid, what is my base, what is my conjugate base. What is ice table? It is very similar to what we did in that equilibrium constant stuff. All right, so basically, they have given me the initial concentration of this solution at 0 0.534 molar, right? Liquid water never shows up, so you can cancel that out. And at the beginning, whenever you have that HCO2 in aqueous, it does not break down into HCO plus and HCO2 yet. So I'm going to start by giving them values of zero, right? And over time, this is going to start dissociating. And since it has the one coefficient, that's why minus one x. If there's one here, one here, these are in the product side, that's why plus one x. For SCO plus plus one x for SCO2 minus. So my at equilibrium, because remember, whenever we talk about Ka, we're talking about the case where it's at equilibrium. That's why we've been using the capital K, right? Because anytime you see the capital K, we're talking about a chemical system that is at equilibrium. 0 0.534 minus x. The SCO plus concentration is going to be plus x. Concentration of SCO2 minus is going to be plus X. All right. Now, what do I know? I know my Ka value. First thing, I'm going to write my formula for Ka value. Ka value is going to be based on this equation. I can write my Ka value as concentration of S3O plus SCO2 minus divided by concentration of formic acid. All right. Now that means K value is 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 4 equals to concentration of H3O plus is plus X. Now look at that. If I calculate the value of plus X, I get my answer. Concentration of the conjugate base is plus X divided by concentration of HCO2H is at equilibrium. Keep this in mind. 0 0.534 minus x. Now, this is where it's going to be really, really important as to what or how I'm going to do this, all right? It is up to you. You can go ahead and solve this out in the quadratic, quadratic equation form of x squared plus bx plus c. But to save me some time, since they told me this is a weak acid, right? Because you're trying to determine the pH from the Ka of a weak acid. For weak acid, what can we approximate is that the reaction literally does not go towards the peroxide. It's mostly 
stays in the reactant side. Meaning that this 0.534 initial concentration of HCO2H does not change. That means this 0.534 minus X stays as if this doesn't change and it stays at 0.534 because this X is going to be infinitesimally small. I hope this makes sense as to what I'm trying to say because it's a weak acid. That means the reaction does not go to completion. Out of let's say 100 molecules, maybe three or four molecules only form this. That's why we're assuming that this 0.534 stays constant. That's why the 0.53 minus x, I'm going to write that as 0.534 because that helps me, right? Because I do not then have to figure out my quadratic equation and then use the formula x equals to minus b plus minus b square minus 4c will save me some time now all i have to do is my equation then look like this 1.8 times 10 to the power minus 4 equals to x squared divided by 0.534 that means my x square is going to be i'm in my calculator somewhere over here times 10 to the power minus 4 times 0 0.534 is going to be 9.612 times 10 to the power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 5, right? But then I'm trying to find the value of x, not x squared. So if I take a square root of this number, right, what I get is square root. No, 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 don't do that. Square root of this number would give me 0 0.00980 all right that means x right here is the s3o plus concentration that means i just figured out my s3o plus concentration now after i find out my S2 plus concentration as 0 0.00980. Right, so I can get that as 0 0.00980, which is the same as 9.8 times 10 to the power minus 3 molar. Right, I mean, now next thing I have to find is the concentration. PH value, pH equals to minus log of S3O plus equals to minus log of log in the value. And your final answer must be equals to around 2.01. All right, so I can look at the answer and the answer is here. So I think I did it right. Good. <laughs> Without, I didn't have my work shown here. But again, I hope this makes sense. How can you determine the pH from a K of a weak acid? Because in three or four slides back, we learned how to find the pH from the K of strong acid. Here we try, we just found it for the weak acid. All right. So now that's more slides from the acid. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move these topics of acid-based titration and then buffer for next week that means acid-based titration so this topic acid-based titration and your buffer stuff this is the acid-based titration versus buffer stuff will not show up for your exam too and i'm going to directly go back go start talking about this chapter 15 there are only three or four slides chapter 15 and we'll be good all right, and that's all you need. Again, no henderson hasselbalch equation, no. And I'm going to move this knowledge check 11 and to next week, knowledge check. No buffer, no titration for exam two. All right, so last couple of slides is considered polyprotic acids and bases. What does that mean? Is basically examples of acids that I've used so far, HCl, has only one hydrogen to donate. Right, 
Now instead of that, if I have something like H2SO4, guess what? This sulfuric acid has two hydrogens to donate. So based on how many hydrogens can it donate, right? Because remember, the way we define our acid is H plus donor. This H cell can donate one H plus, this can donate two H plus. We define them as polyphoretic. So any acid that has more than one H plus to donate, those are called polyprotic acid. If they have two, we define that as diprotic. If they have three, we define those as triprotic. If they have two, diprotic. And then as to what happens in H2SO4, how are the, whenever I use the term protons, it's the same as H plus, keep that in mind. Whenever I use the term proton, it's the same as H plus. So the H plus are lost in a stabilized manner, meaning that if you have H2SO4, the first step that's gonna happen is, right, you're gonna lose one H, and you're gonna form the conjugate base, this, right? Now, to lose on the H, it's gonna start from here, You're going to get SO2 minus because it was a diprotic acid, that's why it lost the proton or the H plus two times. The first time here by forming this conjugate base, the second time here by forming this conjugate base. All right, and the last thing about this polyprotic acid and bases, keep this in mind the fully pronary species, meaning that this right here is always the strongest acid, meaning that if I ask you. Which of these number one, number two, and number three acids are the strongest? It says the fully pronary species, which is my number three, sulfuric acid, is the strongest acid. Then after that, it's going to be the strongest acid, SSO4 minus, and then finally, SO4 2 minus. Right, so this is what I mean by HSO4 is more acidic than HSO4. That's the only concept you need to know about polyprotic acids. And remember about polyprotic bases. We don't have time to cover that. And the last thing for acids and bases from exam two point of view is something called determining the acid and base strength. All right. So basically, if you have a stronger bond between H and the other anion, the weaker that acid is going to be. Right? So what's this? This is HF, HCl, SBr, and HI, right? Look at this bond strength. Do you see how HF, the bond between H and F, it's bond strength. So whenever I use the term bond strength, I'm telling you or saying you how much energy it takes to break this bond apart. Uh, because remember, to kind of define what is the strong acid we are trying to say how does this break into h plus and f minus right if we have more h plus means stronger the acid right that means if you have a stronger bond means it won't break apart and do that means that's going to be your weak acid all right that's why the stronger the bond between h and the counter anion the weaker the acid look at that the strength of the acid increases as we go from left to right, but the, strength, the bond energy increases as you go from right to left. And if you want to know as to why the bond energy decreases or increases as you go from right to left, I have the rationale here. It's basically how the bonds or the valence orbital overlap between H and F versus H and Cl versus H and Br and so on. Uh, moving on, so the last topic for exam two. So again, remember, I'm repeating it again. No SBS studies for exam two. No buffer concept. No henderson hasselbalch equation. <coughs> Right, so now I'm going to start with chapter 15, and the reason I'm doing this is because whatever concept that I've talked about right now is very similar to what I'm going to talk about next. All right. So so far we talked about 
acid, strong acid, weak base, and how they interact with water to form the hydronium ion, and how we can calculate the pH, pOH, and so on. All right. All right, so for this chapter, these are going to be my learning objectives. How can I calculate the solubility of an ionic compound from its KSP? Now, again, the capital K. Same thing. It just tells you the equilibrium constant for a specific condition, right? Whenever I use the term K, I was talking about the equilibrium constant when an acid dissolves in water. Whenever I'm talking about KB, equilibrium constant when base dissolves in water. When I'm talking about TW, I'm talking about the ionic product of water or equilibrium constant for water. All right? So that means KSP must refer to something. Right, and we'll talk about that as to what it means in the next slide. All right, and then we'll talk about different, uh, mostly like solidity issues with ionic compounds and such. All right, so now SP, what does that SP stands for? Is this term solidity product? And we'll talk about that, but before that, let's talk about making sure that you understand what solidity means. So basically, if I put some salt, like let's say AgCl, in water, my water, this is my silicroid dissolved in water, right? That means if the AgCl dissociated into Ag plus and Cl minus means that dissolved in water, right? If it does not means it forms the AgCl back, meaning it did not dissolve in water. That's why the term dissolution to tell me that, oh, we're talking about this ion breaking apart and dissolving water, but precipitation is when you get the solid back. All right, and the solubility is defined as the how much solute you can dissolve in a given volume of a solvent. All right, so now scientists have calculated this something called KSP. That capital K again is the equilibrium constant again. All right, so that just tells you how much salt is soluble in a given solvent all right so let's say this is my salt agcl it breaks down into ag plus and cl minus if it dissolves in water right and that means to write down the equivalent constant expression the ksp just mentioning talking about the solidary product i write down the multiplication of the product so ag plus times cl minus since this is a solid that's why I do not include that in my expression. And that's it. Now the question is, but then what, is, what does this number tell you? Because in our earlier slides for Ka, what we had said was higher the Ka, we said the stronger the acid, right? That was the acid dissociation constant. What does this KSP number tells you? Now, what does this KSP number tell you is higher the KSP number, the more soluble the salt is in water. Meaning that if you look at these numbers, the KSP value increases as you go up, right? From the bottom to the top, the KSP value increases. That's telling you that the solubility of copper chloride, copper one chloride is the highest. The solubility of iron three hydroxide is the lowest. And that's what the KSP value tells you. All right, so again, I hope this that makes sense. Try to break it down into layman's term. Do not just work on your math, get your numbers, try to understand as to what this means. For me, just understand that KSP literally just tells you how soluble is that salt in water. All right, look at this number, 4.10 to power negative 38. Wow, that's a very, very small number. Since that, that is a very, 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 very small number that tells you that iron hydroxide is sparingly, literally very, very, very insoluble in water. All right. So now, uh, here is a flow chart. Just mind the solubility of KSP. Uh, so this is just an example. Don't worry about this flow chart for right now because I'll be using this same flow chart in the next slide. So this is just uh, one of the... idea as to how 
the oldest pins are still soluble in water, right? Because if you look at the solubility of lead chromate, this PBCRO4, that's 4.6 times 10 to the power minus 6 gram per liter of water. Look at that. How small is that number? All right. So again, I'm not going to work through this problem, but I'm going to work through the on the problem here because I'm running out of time. That asks you to determine the solubility from KSP. If you're given the solubility product constant, how can you find the molar solubility of your solid? Again, remember that molar soap is the same as I could literally change that to this number, right? It's all there in grams per liters. So instead of molar solubility being in moles of as it was well to in liters of water, I can literally use the molar mass and then convert that moles to grams per liter, right? That's why it makes like gram solubility. How much how many, how much gram of the salt or the solute dissolves in a liter of water is called gram solubility. But then if I'm talking about molar solubility, I'm talking about how many moles of that solute dissolves in a liter of water. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is something called ice table again. For all of these, think about ice table. All right, so this is talking about this molecule Ag2Cl2, which dissociates, dissociates into Ag2 2 plus and then chloride ion. And then we're trying to kind of understand its solubility. All right? Because apparently we know that mercury, Ag is mercury, is pretty poisonous. All right, but then back then the fusion used to use it as a medication. Now the question, if it is poisonous, why didn't it hurt those people? And why did the fission use it? Is because they are making a point that since the solubility product right here is very small, 10 to the power negative 18, that tells you it is very, very insoluble. Right? Now, based on this KSP value, we're trying to figure out the molar solubility of this species. All right, so now I'm going to follow this flowchart. I'm going to determine the direction of change. Direction of change meaning that I'm going to do the ice table. All right, so my ice table is going to look like this. I'm going to do I. And let me do this here. And you're going to know why I did this here. Now remember, solid does not appear in my KSP, right? Like my KSP. The solid sugar chloride did not appear on it as reactant. So same thing here. That's why I'm disregarding this solid as it is cl two. At the initial, once you put that in water, we do not form any of this yet. Then there is going to be some change when equilibrium reaches. Since we're forming this Ag2 plus, this is going to be plus x, this is going to be plus x. And that's what it means by determining the drift of change. That means I'm forming that Ag2 plus, Ag2 2 plus, and then Cl minus. That's something that I have missed is, since I have this coefficient of 2, it should be plus 2x. That means at equilibrium, the concentration of Ag2 2 plus is going to be x, whereas the Cl minus is going to be 2x. And what does my KSP formula tell me? KSP formula tell me is the product of the concentration of Ag2 2 plus, 2 plus, and the concentration of Cl minus. And I think I'm gonna... Now the question is, to capital K. When we worked out through a problem, right? Let's say when we had N2 plus H2 
NH3 and we had coefficient in front of those. So two nitrogen, two nitrogen, three hydrogen. So when, when we write the when we wrote the equilibrium cons constant expression, it went something like this. Right? That means the coefficient was raised to the power. Right? And that's why do not forget that as well whenever you do that. Cl minus has coefficient of two, that means that should be raised to the power of two as well. Now my KSP formula is 1.1 times 10 to the power minus 18 equals to my Hg2 plus is x. And my 2x is, sorry, chloride minus, concentration of chloride minus is 2x squared, right? Because this square is supposed to be here. I mean, if I do my math, it's going to look like this 4x cubed because 2 times 2 is 4x squared times x is 4x cubed equals to 1.1 times 10 to the power minus 18. That's my x cubed is going to be, I'm just going to show you now here, is 1.1 times 10 to the power minus 18 divided by 4. That means my x is going to be 1.1 times 10 to the power minus 18 divided by 4 to the power 1 third. Or cube root, whatever you're gonna call it. If I remember my, my x is gonna be 6.69 times 10 to the power minus 7 moles per liter. Alright, now something to keep in mind. Do you see how this Hg22 plus x has a one coefficient in front of it? And Hg2 Cl2 has one coefficient in front of it. It tells you that. And I'm going to close my window because I hear someone mowing the garden. Hopefully that died the noise now. Right. So that means whatever value I got for the concentration of Hg2 2 plus x value. That will be the molar solubility of Hg2 Cl2. That means that's telling you that, oh, think about this way, right? So one mole of Hg2 Cl2 solid, when it dissolves, you form one mole of Hg2 2 plus. But since the volume is going to be the same, that means the concentration of this is going to be the same as concentration of this at equilibrium. That's why I can use this. That means my molar solubility of Hg2 Cl2 is going to be 6.69 .6 times to the power 7 molar moles, sorry of Hg2Cl2 dissolves in one liter of water. All right, this is how we can calculate the molar solubility. And if you want, you can take a step at this as well. Again, this is the same concept. There's a flow chart. And I don't have the answer key for this, but give it a step at it. If you want me to work it out and then send you the answer, let me know and I'll definitely do that. And now the last concept that we're going to do before that your knowledge takes well i just made your life easy like i said let me make your life easy since you worked so hard in watching the video and how i worked out this problem so i kind of gave you the whole answer for this question so basically i'm just asking you what is the final answer the molar solubility of sg 2 cl 2 in the previous slide all right, that means all you have to do is if you watch the video, you have the answer. But then having said that, I'm asking you to please take some time, doesn't have to be too long, as to how I worked it out because it's going to help you for your exam. Right. Now you're wondering why do we care about KSP besides the fact that I told you that the higher the KSP value, it tells us how soluble that salt is in some solvent or something, all right? Now, this is a very good example uh, of uh, this is the application of KSP in a medical field. It talks about how do anticoagulant work. If you are wondering what does that anticoagulant work means, 
So think about this, right? So whenever I bleed, let's say I was working in the kitchen and then I accidentally caught my hand, right? If my blood didn't clot, guess what would have happened? I would have bleed myself probably to death, right? But then as soon as the cut happens over time, all right, if I'm able to just plug in that hole, the blood will start clotting, right? You form a clot and then blood will stop flowing out of my body, all right? Now, what does anticoagulant do is prevent the blood from clotting. Now you're wondering why do we need that? Think about it, right? So let's say if you had a nurse does some blood work, he, she, or they, they collect the blood. Now what does blood do? It will start clotting, right? You don't want that to happen because the nurse has to do lots of blood work on that blood. So they add the anticoagulant so that the clot doesn't happen and she can do the test that she wants, All right? So this question basically works on that concept and I have probably the hint, All right? So basically what they do is they add these collection tubes, add this anion C2O4 2 minus to prevent the blood from clotting. Now the question is asking you what considering of this oxalate ion, C2O4 is called the oxalate anion. Most established before calcium oxalate begins to precipitate. And I have given you the hint, does not begin to form, right? So whenever I use the term calcium oxalate, CH2O4 begins to precipitate, it means think about this as when Q equals KSP. And they're asking me the concentration of C2O4 2 minus I. And for this, all you have to do is I know that my KSP for this reaction is going to be because the reaction that I'm looking at is right here. The KSP is going to be the product of the concentration of calcium 2 plus and then C2O4 2 minus. KSP value has been given to me as 1.96 times 10 to the power. Minus eight, which tells me that oh, this salt right here is very, very insoluble, right? Equals to do I know my concentration of calcium two plus? Yes, they have given me the concentration of calcium two plus in a sample of blood serum as two point two times ten to the power negative three. And the only concentration that I do not know is of this oxalate anion, and that's what I'm trying to figure out in this problem. That means my concentration of the C2O4 2 minus, if I do my math, is going to end up being 8.9 times 10 to the power minus. Now, why do you think this is important? Please remember, right? Because the nurse has to add some anticoagulant here. But then they have to be very careful as to what should be the concentration of this C2O4 2, 2 minus. You don't want the concentration to be too small. Because if it's too small or too large, sorry, too large, then the calcium C2O4 is going to start to precipitate. All right. All right. So, KSP tells you that you have that medical application as well. Now, the last concept, for example, I know lots of concepts. Take your time, internalize the concept. Is something called common ion effect. So what I mean by that is, let's say we have been talking about KSP, right? We look at lead sulfide, it's the salt. If I throw it in water, it's gonna dissolve into the PB2 plus ion, and then S2 minus ion, right? Now, when is it, when is it in water, this us assume that its KSP value is and I'm just going to throw some number out there to make our life easier, is 2. And this is not correct, but then I just assume that the KSP value is 2. That tells me that, okay, some of this PBS is sold in water. Now, what does this common ion effect mean? Is basically, now instead of looking at PBS sold in water, if I look at this lead sulfide, solubility in a solution, that has Na2S. And I'm going to circle something. 
I'm going to circle S here. Sulfide anion and then sulfide anion. What happens to solubility of PBS whenever I measure its solubility in Na2S? All right, is going to be less. Now that is called a common ion effect. All right, so basically, solubility of any sparingly soluble salt is almost always decreased by the presence of a soluble salt that contains a common ion. Now, common ion between PBS and Na2S was S, sulfide anion, right? That's why now the KSP value of PBS, the least sulfide, in Na2S might go down to, let's say, 1. And this number are all imaginary. I was trying to make a case here. And that is what a common ion effect is. All right, now this is, if you want to practice this problem, that's for your practice. I'm gonna work one problem out as to how we're gonna use this concept. All right, so this is a question from Alex that I am, this is the last one I promise and we'll be done. Calculate the solubility of transferred resources of calcium chloride in pure water. So let's have this. And then we'll worry about the solubility in sodium chloride solution. First, calcium chloride solution, I'm going to write my equation down. So you have to solve it. This is just into calcium 2 plus aqueous and F minus aqueous. Making sure I add this quotient of 2 after I balance the reaction. Then I'm going to create my ice table. In my ice table, the solid never shows up. Again, remember, I'm trying to find the solubility of C after. All right. <coughs> now at the very beginning when the reaction starts, concentration is zero for calcium two plus, same thing with this. All right? With the chain, since we're forming more of this, it's gonna be plus x, it's gonna be plus two x. So zero plus x is plus x, zero plus two x is plus two x. So this is the equilibrium concentration. All right? And this is what we use when we use the KSP formula. My KSP formula is gonna look like this. Calcium two plus and then chloride minus to the power two. I'm gonna keep in mind, this should be something you don't wanna miss. Also, if you don't miss it, they lose some points. KSP value has been given to me. It says you'll find the KSP data in the LS data tab and the value for KSP was 3.45 times 10 to the power minus 11. Look at the number, so small. That tells you the calcium chloride is not as soluble in water. My calcium two plus is x, f minus is two x, and squared. I mean, if I do my math, right, that's gonna be four x cubed. This is gonna be four x squared times x is gonna be four x cubed. If I do my math, my x is gonna end up as 2.05, times 10 to the power negative 4. What's the unit? Remember, these are all in molarity. That means moles per liter. But, and remember, one thing to keep in mind, what I've said is this concentration is for the calcium 2 plus ion, not for the calcium F2. And similar to what I said in my earlier problem, right, as to one is to one ratio. Even for this, I said one is to one ratio, so we can assume that the solubility or calcium fluoride, since it's one is to one ratio, is the same as that as well. That means my solubility for calcium fluoride is going to be 2.05 times 10 to the power minus 4 moles of calcium chloride dissolves in one liter of water. But the question is asking me so in pure water in grams per liter. Is that an issue? No, because I know that my molar mass of calcium chloride, I just look that up, I see my number as 78.075 grams per mole. Right, so 78.075 grams in one mole. 
And look at that, my final answer is mole of calcium chloride dissolves in one mole. That means I found the grams of calcium chloride that dissolves in one liter of water as 0 0.01601 gram of calcium chloride dissolves in one liter of water. All right, now the last question that we're going to do is volubility of calcium chloride in this concentration of sodium fluoride. Now, if you look at this, fluoride, fluoride, that tells you that, oh, that is a common ion effect. That means the solubility of CaF2 in NaF solution must be less than this number because that's what we talked about, common ion effect, right? Must all is almost always decreased. All right, so with this, let's work this out. I'm gonna erase all this. So again, I'm gonna write my calcium two plus aqueous, and I'm directly writing the product side. I don't need to write the reactant side because the solid does not swap in my right. So my ice table looks like this. My eyes is zero at calcium two plus. Now, and this is where it's going to be really, really important. Remember, my concentration of sodium fluoride is 0 0.0110 molar sodium fluoride. Since we're looking at the solubility in this, at the very beginning, the concentration of F minus is going to be the same. 0 0.0110 molar. All right, so I hope this is making sense as to how I got the number 0 0.0110 molar concentration of F minus. All right, because think about this NAF, where is that here? NAF dissociates into Na plus F minus. If the concentration of NAF is 0 0.0110, since it's one is to one ratio, that's why F minus is going to have the same concentration as well. Same number of moles, same volume means same concentration. Now, over time, since so this is the product side, you're going to get plus x here, all right, and then plus 2x for my fluoride ion because I have this coefficient of 2 here. So my equilibrium is going to be plus x and then 0 0.0110 plus 2x. Then I'm going to add my KSP value. equals to calcium 2 plus and then fluoride minus to the power 2. My so the product KSP value for fluoride ion has been given as 3.45 times 10 to the power minus 11 equals to calcium 2 plus has a value of x, 0 0.0110 plus 2x for the fluoride anion. Right now I can work it out to the quadratic equation all right but i can make my life easy the way i'm going to make my life easy is because we know that calcium f2 has a very high ksp or it's a very sparingly soluble salt that means we can assume that this x value right here is going to be really, really small. That means I can cancel this 2x out. Does it mean that that's going to be really, really small? All right, so when I do that, I'm going to get something like this 3.45 times 10 to the power minus 11 equals to. 0 0.0110 square to the power x. Then you do your math, your x value is going to be 2.851 times 10 to the power negative 7. All right, now this is the concentration of calcium 2 plus. Right, but then if you think about this calcium fluoride, it's in the ratio of one is to one. That means this is the concentration 
going to be for calcium CF2 as well. We're trying to find the solubility of that CF2. That's in moles per liter. Now I use the same molar mass of 78.075 grams per liter. Sorry, grams per mole, sorry. I can cancel out the mole and mole. And then my final answer is in grams per liter, which my solubility of that is gonna be 2.226 times 10 to the power negative five grams per liter, which is smaller, which is good, right? Because remember, the common, common I effect tells me that the solubility of calcium chloride in water should be more than the solubility of calcium chloride in sodium chloride solution. I mean, this number should be greater than this. All right, so this is the end of weekly material, except for the buffer and SBS titration, which I'm going to talk about in the next class. And for tomorrow's lecture, all I'm going to do is I'm going to review for your exam. That's all I'm going to do. Anything I cover until today from week three, that's a fair game for your exam 